Yaat Eshuk Eh, Arushu Dene'e. Greetings, my kin and my people. This is Lila June, and you're here for episode three of Neheje, Our Voices, an Indigenous Solutions podcast. I'm so honored and grateful to be here today with three very wonderful people Trisha Mokino, Halle Turning Heart, and Marcus Briggs Cloud. I know each of these people personally in some capacity, and it has been an honor to get to know them. Uh, They are each warriors for their language, and each of them are raising their children exclusively in the indigenous language of their people. And each of them have raised fluent speakers. I know that a lot of us as indigenous peoples, uh, we are worried about our languages. Um, There's only a little over 200 languages that are still spoken in the U.S. and Canada that are indigenous languages. And of those uh, little over 200, what I heard the statistic was, was only about 30 of them are being spoken by the children. And anyone who knows about language loss, this is a huge tragedy because if the children aren't learning it, it really doesn't matter how many elders know it. It's It's a moribund, as they say, or dying language. And so it's really exciting to be with these three people who exemplify how we can bring our languages back. Yeah, each of them have their own immersion schools where they are teaching language to many people, uh, but they're also very connected to their, their own children's lives. So they're really working to make sure their children have that language as parents. So even though each of them has incredible stories regarding what they've done in the world, you know, Trisha has started with many helpers. She started an amazing language immersion school here in New Mexico. Uh, Halle is working in the Yuchi language immersion school, which is just incredible. And Marcus Briggs Cloud, of course, is working in an incredible Muscogee language immersion eco village in Alabama. So each of them are doing extraordinary things. Um, but we're very lucky to see, uh, to talk a little bit about their home life and how, what it takes to raise a fluent child. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Halle uh, from the Yuchi Nation. Um, she is an incredible sister who has done a lot of work for her language and for her people in general. Um, Halle Turning Heart is a project administrator uh, for the Yuchi Language Project. And the Yuchi language is originally from northern Alabama area um, and and different parts of the southeast. And Halle holds a linguistics degree from Dartmouth College. Uh, She also attended the University of Auckland, New Zealand, hanging out with the Maori. Uh, That must have been fun. And, and even went to Charles University in Prague. So she's been around the world and, and has decided to come back home. Uh, she could probably have gone anywhere, <laughs> but she has served her Yuchi people for over 10 years as a language educator and has helped to establish the Yuchi Immersion School in 2018. She's been learning to speak Yuchi from her elders since she was a child and she's now raising her three young children solely in the Yuchi language. She mentors other parents in decolonizing their home language and reclaiming indigenous lifeways. Um, so I'll, I'll pose the same question to you, Hale. Um, what has been your experience raising children solely in your indigenous language? <laughs> The pole aso gua hale eze ti yuji ha ke da nande zo ya ha. Seminole ha de ze sho da se yuji ha go wede ne e zio to le nahiro on da jen shta ha e. Lare di ha shen ke shta pe shen hiro on da li ta andi da he e on kam fe. Zio to to ina na ka ke ina. Kere yuji ha e le o di ko wede agan sala kere o yunda. Ahende na wile na anze do dwati san le karita. Thank you for that introduction, Lila, and for hosting this podcast. And I, I love that it's called a solutions podcast because I really believe what we're talking about today is is the uh, ultimate solution to the loss of our languages and uh, keeping them alive as living languages in our communities. As you identified, when we have children speaking our languages as their first language, as their mother tongue, 
that's the ultimate hope for future generations of speakers and that's definitely been my life's journey and my life's work um, now I feel like I've taken on the uh, ultimate role as a mother of three young uh, UT language speakers and every day we wake up you know Yuji Hale Odikantwe de Agalasan Anzirit Nichisan like Dage Hatalan I uh we start our day in UT and then all throughout the day and then at bedtime singing and praying in our language and I can't say I can't say enough you know how how fulfilling that work is and what a blessing it is to witness the rebirth of our language in a sense so our UT language is an isolate meaning it's unrelated to any other language and I had the privilege of working with our uh, fluent elders who grew up speaking Yuchi as their first language and many of them have passed away now and uh, I, I knew most of them when they were in their 80s and 90s and so I uh, learned as much as I could from them and now have the opportunity to pass it on to the next generation and not only my kids, but there are four other babies in our community who are now starting to be raised in our Yuchi language and uh, other parents I work with through the Yuchi language project that I'm helping to mentor and um, build a, a community because we know kids need friends, they need peers, they need people to talk to and this is all part of the work and as Tricia was saying the uh, having some schooling alternatives or an approach to keep the language going throughout their growing up years um, is so important so that's one of our um, on you know ongoing in progress developments is to promote a Yuchi language education in the Yuchi language um, immersion program and offer kids like my own an alternative to going to English school where they would presumably lose their language and uh, so that's all part of this work and I I really appreciate Tricia everything that she shared you know I look to her for a guiding light in this work since I'm much earlier in my journey in terms of raising my kids my oldest is six and then my youngest is one um, and also to Magus for inspiration with his family and uh, in this work you know it's easy to feel isolated but having this support network is so important so much appreciation to the group here Alec Arita Galakea Anshachi and over the years having this connection has really helped to promote our efforts and um, keep us going amidst any storms or um, rough patches along the way so definitely this is a marathon and <laughs> I've been running <laughs> since I was a little girl I didn't grow up with Yuchi as my first language so I'm a second language speaker and I've had the exposure from childhood which has really helped me um, but I wasn't like raised in a language I didn't really have much immersion learning and so I've had to piece together a lot of domains that I never witnessed I never witnessed a child being raised in the language of being disciplined or taught or diaper changing um, all of these real life things that you have to do if you're raising your kids solely in your own language and so it's been a really interesting journey but for me um, seeing these breakthroughs along the way when my first born was um, about one I started hearing him speak Yuchi in his sleep like talking uh, sleep talking and I knew he was dreaming in our language and that's mm -hmm. that was the first indicator that you know this is working and for me that was so important because at the time I was separated from our Yuchi community I was living in Alaska when he was born and so um, I was his only language source and uh, 
seeing the power of the mother tongue was it was very real for me and just over the years I've seen how much difference one person can make and I have to recognize my father as my language source and he gave me the opportunity to learn the language and the support to now raise my own kids in the language and I believe you know he's divided He's devoted his life to restoring the Yuchi language, and without his efforts, I believe the language would have already almost been lost. And um, I know Magus and Trisha are also those, you know, guiding lights in their communities with, you know, one person's commitment to speak their language and to carry it on. It can go so far. And definitely in our home life, um, having someone in the home. Because for me, you know, my husband doesn't speak Yuchi fluently. He's a learner of Yuchi and he's Lakota and knows some Lakota and uses that as well. But um, I'm their main Yuchi language source as well as the Yuchi language project and our, our language habitat we make in the program. You hear this from a lot of people my age in their 20s and 30s. They say, I can understand Dinebizad, but I can't speak it. Uh, what would you, what's a, what's a um, solution to that that you would suggest to, you know, to make sure that your kid doesn't become someone who can understand it a little bit, but doesn't want to actually speak it? Mm, that's a really great question and definitely complex. Um, one of the things with our kids being so young is even though I'm speaking to them all the time in our language, I make sure that they speak back in full sentences and don't let them off with just a head nod or comprehension, but they have to produce and making sure that they're practicing, you know, telling stories, talking um, to other people in conversation, getting the fluency and practice. And then having, I think, peers and other people they can talk to will help to um, give them that dynamic where they're motivated to speak, you know. If it's just the mom saying, Yuji Halitwe Day, <laughs> that'll only go so far. And I, I think um, as they enter the teenage years and beyond, I know it's a long journey and there's all these dynamics that come in. But the social aspect is important, and that's part of why we're trying to build a whole generation of speakers at once in order to support one another um, and uplifting uplifting them as the future of our, our language and our people and our ceremonies. That's one of the important aspects of our language is keeping our ceremonies alive. And without our language, we really can't continue um, those ceremonies that renew our relationship with the earth and keep our identity alive and our um, purpose here on earth as Yuchi people, Zoyaha Kenena. So those are some of the things that fuel me in this work and I think um, we've been able to develop speakers for our grounds and young people who are now able to carry on the speeches and give the calls and make medicine so that we can carry on our ceremonies. And that's been a, an important part of this work. Thank you so much, Hale, for sharing uh, beautiful stories. And uh, like Trisha said, it's amazing that we can actually pull this off in this world. And each of you are proof that we can. And so, you know, I haven't had my children yet, but when I do, you all inspire me to, to make sure to do the best job that I can. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Trisha. Uh, I walked into her language school one day and I just said, hey, how you doing? And wrote a fun article about her school in Indian country today. If you want to check it out, it's called uh, Self-Determination Superstars. And it's talking about her school, the Karis Children's Learning Center. So Trisha Mokino is a mama, a wife, an auntie, a daughter, a niece, and a member of her tribal community. She is the co-founder, educational director, and Karis Speaking Elementary Guide at Karis Children's Learning Center in Cochiti Pueblo, New Mexico, what is now called New Mexico. 
She is from the tribal nations of Cochiti Pueblo, Gewa, Okeawinge, uh, and those three in here in New Mexico. She's a certified Montessori elementary school teacher, um, and she's also a primary guide. She received her MA at the University of New Mexico in elementary and bilingual education, where she completed a really interesting master's thesis looking at the hybridization of Montessori method and indigenous language immersion, uh, which eventually became the, uh, the, the, the blueprint for the Karis Children's Learning Center. So uh, her daughters actually inspired her to act on that vision. So without further ado, um, I'd love to hear, Trisha, what is your story of raising children who are fluent in Karis, a very beautiful language indigenous to this beautiful desert that we call home? Raising our, our girls, starting with our oldest, Akuritz, was really, for me, it was language to be our language of Karis. But then to be able to be exposed and to know my grandma, which was her great-grandmother. So our oldest daughter is now 17, and our youngest daughter is 14. But it was our oldest daughter, of course, that really um, got to have a lot of time with my grandmother. My grandmother is Coach T. And when, when, when our daughter was born at that time, we lived here in our family home here in Coach T Pueblo. And so that was the dialect that she was really immersed in because she also attended the tribe's language nest. And then, she, so she was immersed in lots of Coach T. Karis because of my grandma, because of me, because of my mom. But she was also immersed in Kiwa, the Kiwa dialect of Karis, because of my husband. And so what it was like, I now see, I once heard Mary Eunice Romero. She is also a Coach T tribal member, and she is a professor at Arizona State University now. But I once heard her say that um, in her trips to New Zealand, that they had every belief that a non, non-first speaker, so I am a second language speaker of Karis, could absolutely, like a learner, could absolutely raise their children to be first speakers of the language. And so I, I believed with, you know, everything that I had that it that that could be possible. And so when she was born in 2004, of course, there's nothing more that I, that I wanted. And at that time, I had already been working in the Coach T Language Revitalization Program for five years had already been trained in Montessori um, and could see how Montessori could work in service to language revitalization. And at that point had been a public school teacher on a reservation at, at our, it's a public school at Coach T School in the first and second grade class. And um, being a part of the Coach T language revitalization, which was um, run by the tribe, you know, was a really pivotal point in my life and a very ins- it was very inspirational in so many ways because I never thought I would um, love language and was meant to be um, a language teacher and to teach the language. I never considered myself um, to be able to because I was not a first language speaker until I was invited to be a part of that, that program. But of course, you all know and having children inspires you to do so much and to be a better person and I think to really evaluate what do you want in life and for me our Pueblo way of life our language but my grandparents were so loving and they really helped my mom to raise me after my beloved father passed away when I was almost five and he is from Okeawinge But I just think about how they talk to their kids, how they talk to their grandchildren. My grandmother, we used to fight. You know, we still slept communally all in one room on the floor or wherever, the couch. Or, you know, we had a pull-out bed back then. But I remember me and my brothers, who are really my first cousins, would fight who would get to lay next to my grandma, you know, and just like even the conversations happening there, them fighting in Karis. And remember, I I wasn't fluent in Karis. I was already speaking English by then. 
um, but how she would talk to us had that do a ima asa to see asha asha nuptusa to see um sha sha nat itzi isa everything sa means my child, and people in English don't talk like that very often. It's you know it it's like intentional, and I know there are endearing terms, but it doesn't sound the same, and I really feel like. Our languages are like love languages. They're languages that center children and center survival. But that in centering children and survival, it's also um, it's humility and it's oh thank you, thank you to the land for this gift that you have given us of food. Thank you to this animal or thank you to this plant. Everything like this culture and this language that are are. Ancestors have created as has come from humility and 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 respect, and our children can't learn that from how our ancestors have gifted us that if we don't give them the language. Because I don't care who says that you can still practice your culture in English. Yes, you can. I'm not arguing that, but it is not the same. And things will get things get lost in translation, and yes, cultures evolve, and yes, languages evolve, and language I still feel is is everything. It's just different. And so, with our daughter, she was she did become Karis was was her first language, and I just always remember being inspired. My husband is a first language speaker of Karis in the Kiwa dialect. And when she was born, just you know, demanding respectfully and lovingly, all the Kara speakers in my family, you may not talk to her in English. You have to talk to her in Kara, and and everybody did, and you know, just being supported by both our tribes, both our communities, her going to the language nest, and after one of our dances here, in the village, we had to run up to Santa Fe and. Poor thing, she was sick, and she was about a year and a half. And her dad was carrying her over his, like you know, like she just had her head right here on her lap on his shoulder, and and she threw up. <laughs> you know, she threw up, and I was like, oh my god, she's not feeling good. And then like, oh my god, she strung all these words together. You know, she made her sentence in our language, like you know what Hale was saying about like we can't just let them off with a head nod or anything. They have to produce the speech, and like I wasn't making her anything, but that's like what immersion does is then they start um, th- that emergence of speech happens. And so she, what she said was, "Ooh, washa," and you know it wasn't correct, but she was using what language she had and what she was trying to express. Is I threw up, you know? So I was like, "Oh." So Oh, you know, like oh no, you're like not feeling good, and like I was like, oh my god, she's, you know, her first face, and you know, it's just really exciting. And so then, you know, that culminating, oh, that was like not a culmination, but you know, her getting to two and a half, me being a public school teacher and being like, oh no, where where am I going to send her? There's no educational setting, even in the the early childhood settings in our villages. English is centered. It wasn't our language being centered, and that, and then me being this Native American, whatever indigenous, you know, coach Tikiwa Okeo Inge woman teacher, having to um, be complicit, perpetuate this assimilative education that we know our children are not thriving in, uh, and then like. No setting to send my daughter to to continue her learning in the language. I left, and I and I said at that point, you know, had enough experience with the language program to know that we needed to create our own、um, early childhood setting that would continue the language and that we could immerse our girls, our girls in. And nobody's gonna do it for us. You know, we have to do it ourselves. And so. In two thousand six, I left the public school, our local public school system, and then started working with our board and then our tribal councilman, who said we have to ask for permission. We have to be transparent. We don't just do this quietly. We do it with the blessing, and we do it the right way. And so, really using 
um, how leadership, the leadership that was modeled to me, not in the, not in American white men's way, college way, not that our own, we still have our own governance system that is from thousands of years ago that is still in existence today. So what made you have the audacity to think that you could start a school from thin air? You know, because I think a lot of us have those dreams, right? A lot of Native people have these dreams, but I think a lot of us give up, right? Because it's like, oh, I can't do that. I'm not, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough training or whatever. You know, what What was it that told you, you know, I, I can start a school and, and made you just go for it? Mm, I don't know. I think, like, you know, people say, well, you had a dream. And I don't know that it was a dream. I feel like I was doing what was right for what I was taught from my grandparents, how to be a coach tea and you a person. When my grandpa and my mom and my grandma dropped me off at school, my grandpa said to me and Karis, he said, I let you go to school, but don't you ever forget that you still have our way to continue learning and our language. That's our education. That's who we are. And I believe that with all my heart because my grandparents were amazing. My mom, my Aunt Jan, my Auntie Nadine, my uncle. And I want that for my girls. Because I know I couldn't find that anywhere else. And so I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I just prayed. And I just shared. And I told my husband, this is what I want to do. I told my family and they said they'll support me. They didn't know what I was talking about. Our board members, our councilmen, they didn't know, but they just trusted because we pray and our children inspire us and we're supposed to be better and do better. Wow, thank you so much for that answer. And I, I didn't know how big of a question that was, so I appreciate you holding space for it and, and answering. It's you're, you really inspire people like me because you know I have dreams of creating a a university, you know, for indigenous knowledge where old, where we can catch them once they graduate from high school, you know, where they can continue. And it's sort of like this has never been done in this way. Yeah, there's Native Studies departments, there's a, a American Studies departments where they can kind of try to exist as indigenous scholars, but like we don't have a whole university from the ground up, you know, our way. So. I'm not the only one, you know, so many of my generation has really gorgeous ideas and, you know, all those listening, I just encourage you to go for it. You know, the worst that can happen is you fail and you learn and then you get up the next day and try again. Um, is there anything else you want to share, Trisha, on this topic? I think just to be able also to respect what our children want. Our, my daughter's, our daughter, Akurit, she's 17 years old and our youngest daughter is 14 and 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 to know that I also have to respect, you know, eventually, you know, what they want to, but at least they have a choice. At least they have choices and at least they don't have to wonder and at least they have a foundation to build on and they, at least they know that they are a mirror of their ancestors in every way possible and that you know, just to believe and to pray and to have respect and to have appreciation and gratitude um, for their immediate ancestors and then the ancestors from hundreds of years ago and thousands of years ago because any privileges that they have today, any beauty, any joy is still due to them because of their fight and their refusal to give up to be who we are as, as our people, as Pueblo people, and then more specifically as Coach T people, as Kiwa people, as Oke Wenge people, the tribes that I come from. 
and absolutely when you have these dreams and these visions of 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 doing what you want to do like you will see your university someday if you're doing it for the right reasons if you're doing it for your people for your community and you're you're working to disrupt exceptionalism and you're doing it um, from your heart for your children thank you so much trisha it's an honor to have you here um co-founder of the Caris Children's Learning Center in Cochitin, Pueblo, New Mexico. Um, and now we're going to move to one of my dear friends and brothers who has done a lot of incredible work in Alabama and all over the southeast, actually. I'm just going to read a little bit about him before I ask him the same question. Marcus Briggs Cloud is Muscogee, a language revitalizer, a scholar, and like me, he's also a musician. Sometimes we can't figure out what we want to be when we grow up, so we just do it all. Uh, he's a co-director of Iganyofology, an indigenous eco-village in Weogufka, Alabama, uh, comprised of Muscogee persons who have returned to their ancestral homelands to practice linguistic, cultural, and ecological sustainability. He also happens to be a graduate of Harvard Divinity School and a doctoral candidate in interdisciplinary ecology at University of Florida. Um, he received uh, some NAMIs, Native American Music Awards, which I think is wonderful. Uh, some NAMI nominations, I should say, for his uh, Muscogee Hymn album, which is completely in the Muscogee language, uh, which the album translates to Honor Our Elders. Uh, he's partnered with his wonderful wife, who I've also met, Tana Little, who's also Muscogee, and their two beautiful children, um, Himoki and Maconico. And uh, Marcus enjoys speaking exclusively in the Muscogee language with his kids, which I have seen firsthand. Uh, beautiful work you've done. I've been to uh, Iganyofology. It's a gorgeous, like several hundreds of acres in Alabama where they're bringing back the buffalo, the sturgeon, the language, the montane longleaf pine. I mean, it's just a it's just a beautiful, comprehensive um, system, which I'm sure Marcus will talk a little bit about. But Marcus, what was your experience, you know, raising children who were f who were fluent in Muscogee? And, and yeah, what what is your story about? So I just got confused here all the way. I'm like the words I got into as and what I'll get the put it away as more and when the Belgians go walk it away as they. But when I got to know she has my children, I got hundred into as and. Uh, I, my name is Marcus. I'm a Muscogee person and a son of the Wind Clan and an in-law to the Skunk Clan. And happy to be here in the presence of Halle and Trisha that are doing this really sacred work and appreciate this invitation from you, Lila, and hosting this kind of conversation um, that people don't really talk about that often, as has been stated. When I was a teenager, I, you know, looked around and noticed that there just weren't uh, young people that were speaking our language. But everybody, you know, had access to language speakers at the time. But um, I knew that I wanted my children uh, to be fluent speakers and. Um, you know, that wasn't the only reason I wanted to have children, but kind of, you know, I, I wanted kind of like a language project because I knew it, you know, it needed to be carried on. And you have more, you know, control, if you will, over your own children than you do other people's children or more so the parents of other people's children, of, of the children, uh, not being able to control what choices they make uh, for their children. So I always said, you know, when I have children, I'm not going to speak a word of English to them. And 
that's the way that it's played out. I, I've never spoken a word of English to my children since they were born. It's a difficult commitment, but it's not just speaking to them that is a challenge. There are other challenges that creep in. And I would say that the biggest threat to the survival of our languages today is, is obsolescence, uh, because we interface with settler colonial societies that have this abundance of vocabulary that our own languages don't have. And some people have, you know, different philosophies on how to approach obsolescence. And my approach is perhaps more orthodox. You know, people label me as more of a purist. I'm, I'm not really, as Trisha spoke about her elders and traditional education and uh, language, the, the words of her grandfather, I uh, feel really similar in, in the way that, um, you know, we have our own language, our own knowledge system. And some people's approach to addressing obsolescence is to compile these long lists of, of um, words, which carry uh, lots of connotative baggage from the Western world that don't coincide because our societies, our traditional life ways, don't include those actions or those concepts or those particular nouns. Uh, yeah, as, as Trisha said again, you know, people will always say, oh, well, languages evolve. Well, you know, we have to kind of be gatekeepers of what it is, um, how we allow our languages to culturally evolve, how our societies culturally evolve. And you have to put on that kind of traditional lens and say, is this healthy? Is what we're adopting healthy for our people? Just because it exists in English, we don't need to have a word for everything that exists in English, because there are a lot of things in the English worldview that are not healthy or they don't coincide with our values, and that's okay. I used to think that it was a kind of noble endeavor to approximate all these long lists of words. I mean, I would see people trying to come up with terms for, you know, molecular bond and cumulonimbus cloud and things like this, that while words in our language that we already have are kind of going by the wayside that correspond to our own cosmological worldview that, that uh, we don't have approximations in English for. And, and so it, demonstrates where the power dynamic is of the world between the two worldviews. And I figured, well, you know, by the time you dump 3,000 plus words into your lexicon that are inherently premised on post-industrialization, capitalist ideology, that we deviate so significantly from the traditional ethos that our ancestors left to us in the first place, it's like, well, why don't we just speak English if all we're going to do is whitewash the language? And so I started to think, well, how do we address this. We need to recreate the society that the language once functioned best in. And that's a society that's inherently premised on intimate relations with the natural world. Because when you're raising children in the language, um, the only reason that I have been able to not speak English to them is because we created a container in which our language could function best. And everything that we do here in our eco-village uh, we reclaimed uh, some of our ancestral homelands from which we were displaced in 1836 um, here in what's commonly colonially known as Central Alabama. We, we came here to live as an off-grid income-sharing community, and we interrogate everything that we do here through the lens of the language. That's to say that um, we have this small allowance for the creation of some new descriptive words, but uh, there's a threshold. We stop it at, at a certain point and we make sure that um, our natural building work and our regenerative agricultural work, for instance, is happening um, in a way that we don't have to create an abundance of new vocabulary. So what I believe is that for traditionally agrarian societies, if our contemporary life ways are not fixated on regenerative agriculture, that there's no way that our languages are going to be able to thrive. So in our language work here with our children, um, our curriculum is is centered on uh, traditional ecological and agricultural knowledge. We don't uh, care that much about Western curriculum. And that also means that we had to create uh, a sustainable reg and regenerative economic uh, plan. I say regenerative uh, from an ecological perspective and uh, an economic one, really, but a, a sustained income. Um, that's good to earth, that speaks to our values, and that provides opportunities for our children. They don't have to leave our village uh, when they get older, and so that their education continues. I, I heard an indigenous man from the Amazon say one time, uh, why do you send your kids away 
to college when they turn 18, don't you have more to teach them? Of course, you know, but but our people aren't thinking that way. Um, and so uh, this is a whole kind of decolonization paradigmatic shift and language is the core of it. It's the impetus for this work. But if we didn't have the whole container to raise our children in here, I would say that our, uh, the language that our children speak would not really reflect uh, the traditional ethos, the values um, and the cosmology that is what makes us actually unique as Muscogee people. When people are talking about a community, so Trisha had elders that were able to speak. Uh, she said, please only speak in, in Karis to my children. Um, we don't have that opportunity as Muscogee people, really, because people are so spread out because of the diaspora, But uh, and there just aren't that many speakers anymore, right? So we had to create that scenario. You'll hear folks say things like, well, that's great, you're raising children in the language, but what if you don't speak the language? How am I supposed to raise them in the language? And And that's the beauty of living in this intentional community, is that if somebody has a child, they don't have to feel the pressure on their shoulders to be the sole speaker to that child, but they have to be willing to let the child be raised by the community of speakers here. And so we all participate in the language learning. But there are sacrifices too. So my partner, who I mentioned is a, is a skunk clan, uh, she's made incredible sacrifices. She's a conversational speaker, but um, you know my children are fluent speakers and, and she can't stay in conversation with them the whole time, but she made uh, remarkable sacrifices to keep them from English. So... That's a major piece of it, too, because the things that, that she would have normally done or that other parents are doing in kind of what we'd say a white way with their kids, she shields them from that and says, you know, maybe this is a sacrifice of my relationship with my children and some at some level. I mean, she has a very intimate relationship with them, but there are things that she would normally, I think, want to do that she says, wait, no. Our first experiences that the children have in anything through their life, we want it to be in the language so that they're not thinking in translation. And that's tough because there's not, you know, there are things that a mother wants to do with their child that uh, our first experiences. And she has to say, I need the vocabulary for this or I need to step aside and I need a fluent speaker, my partner or their grandma or whoever to do this, uh, share this experience with them in the language. Um, and 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 I say, you know, there are things, beautiful things, like we didn't have to worry about, you know, whether or not we had a good language education through this pandemic. We haven't had that concern. We've been able to stay isolated here in our community. Um, this is one of the benefits of, of, of uh, living in an intentional community. We put boundaries up here. We have no English zones to protect the ears of the children. And everybody in the community has to respect these boundaries or you have to pay a quarter for every offense English word that's used in, in uh, as we go along. There are two more things I wanna say um, that are really challenging. We don't have a TV. We, we never had a TV and that was intentional so that the kids were not exposed to English. We didn't want them to go to public school. I, I think people talk a lot about um, boarding schools having such a major impact on their, our languages, and there's no doubt that they have had a major impact on indigenous languages. However, if boarding schools would have never happened, public school and television combined would have done the same job, and they are doing the job of eradicating our languages now. And people don't want to talk about that uh, because it places more responsibility on us than than the settler. Um, so decolonizing our life ways, um, we do have to feel empowered in this. I also want to say that, you know, our health is so important in raising children uh, in the language because, again, this is a community endeavor and in situations where there are very few speakers left. Um, it's so important to decolonize our diet. My aunt is a fluent speaker. She lives here in the village. She didn't have the energy to work with the children because she was a severe diabetic, um, high blood pressure, you know, too much fry bread and spam and all these things like all in all Indian communities. But uh, we have a concerted effort here to decolonize our diet and we grow our own food. We raise these animals, endangered livestock breed. Uh, an endangered species uh, for food sovereignty and grow organic crops here. And 
She's lost over 50 pounds and completely off of insulin and doesn't take high blood pressure medication anymore. And she's got lots of energy to work with the children in the language. This is very key. Uh, you can't have a monologue just in the language. You have to have a community of speakers to have dialogical impact on the children. And that's been so important because the majority of our speakers are old and have compromised health. And so uh, we believe that's so important. But around here, there are two major rules to successful uh, language revitalization work. And the first is no English. Don't speak English. And the second rule is you have to have a lot of love in your heart. If you don't have a lot of love in your heart for the language, for the children, then don't get involved in this work. Much love required to do this sacred work. So, nak magere chayazi bad madi gostos che. Nijonie kyahen sago. Thank you so much for sharing beautiful words. And uh, I can't help but notice, you know, each of you have really um, dedicated spouses. That's another thing. The wars on our people and boarding schools and what have you have really broken up the the family units. And I can't help but also honor your husband, Trisha, for saying, I will support you. You know, like, it's such a profound thing for an indigenous man to say, like, I will support my wife's vision, you know. Um, and I think that that's something that a lot of Native women really need. You know, we need our men to step up and to hold space for our dreams to to be planted and to come to fruition. Because as women folk and, and also men folk too, as Marcus and many of our brothers show, you know, we have these, uh, these special abilities and these special responsibilities to change the world and effectuate change. And I think uh, for me, you know, being 32 and still single, you know, I can't help but notice how beautiful it is that each of you have found your mate. And obviously you need a mate to have children. And surely we can do it as single people, you know, there's there's still hope for us. <laughs> but I can't help but notice how much it's, it's helped you all to have that counterpart there. We're now just going to move into, you know, just a free-flowing conversation. You know, there's nothing specific you need to say or anything, but I'm sure that each of you have sparked ideas in each other's minds, listening to each other's stories. Is there anything any of you would like to say after hearing each other? Uh, so to your point there, Lila, about um, having supportive spouses, especially men, yeah, I just want to say that I have been around Halle many, many times when she's speaking to her children since they've all been born in Yuchi. And I can say that fathers have different relationships to their children than mothers do. And you just can't replace the connection that a mother has to a child uh, with a, a, a man. That's why I believe wholeheartedly in the importance of investing in girls uh, as they transition uh, to, well, girls from, from birth to transition to womanhood, that they be really supported, equipped with rich traditional knowledge, and of course, with language from the ground up so that they can be the primary source of language for their child. and. That's why my partner makes uh, such a huge sacrifice because she really wants um, our children to be able to raise their children in the language so successfully um, with that with that connection, especially our daughter. Uh, one day, if, if she has the gift of children, uh, to be um, really efficacious in transmitting language uh, as as the, the the mother. Oh, San Lakeasota Kalanjaha. Um. I I think we know that language learning starts in the womb and beginning this process is really long before a child is even conceived. You know, we've all had a long journey, a long preparation period and verbalizing that commitment to, and I don't even know where exactly mine came from, but I just started saying it like years before I had kids that I would raise them in the language. Um, and speaking to them in the womb and singing to them and they're already hearing the language before they're born. And then going through the, you know, the birth and the nursing and these stages all in the language, it is a special connection that I guess is why they call it, you know, the mother tongue. Um, and I think 
all of us have kind of talked a little bit about the love connection. You know, Tricia was saying it's a love language. And that, you know, uh, it's just different. I'd like to hear if anyone wants to share about how do you imagine this is such a different relationship with our kids than it would have been in an English, raising them in English, you know, in a colonial language. And, um, or how do you imagine that it's different and how is this special to your family? I, I think um, Holly and Marcus, what Marcus had to say earlier, just about, you know, when we are talking to our children just here at KCLC, I always tell everybody, like, we don't have time to make, say, make up a word for a computer. We don't have time to make up a word for just say the word in English and then keep talking in Keras, right? Um, and we're, we're fortunate that we still do have like our community and we're, we're trying to maintain it and, and strengthen it. So I just, I, I, I really appreciate it hearing you say that. I haven't ever heard that word obsolescent. So thank you for teaching me about that. And Hale, to your question, our indigenous languages, I can't speak for your languages, but I do believe that our, our Keras language centers children. It centers children and it centers growth. And of course, it centers survival in, um, in deep relationship and intimate relationship and in gratitude. And that is a connection that is hard. I, I think would be hard. I don't know because I we do have our language. I believe that would be a connection that would be hard to give to children. And it is hard if you're only at the mercy of talking in English. And so I, everywhere I go, I am like, everybody needs to learn their indigenous languages. The, the, everybody has an indigenous language to co go back to. And so I don't, I don't want to imagine a world where we are only at the mercy of talking to our children of English because that in a way that's taboo. I don't, I want to imagine and keep um, praying and hoping for all of our languages to, to come back to, there's many um, brilliant people and non-Indigenous people that support us in these efforts. You know, Dr. Jim, Jim Cummins and Dr. Lily Wong Fillmore I don't know if he was supportive of languages, but he was a phenomenal um, language revitalization person that I learned a lot from Dr. Joshua Fishman in terms of what is a healthy language, and that is an intergenerational, a language that is spoken across the generations. So I just think people who are only monolingual don't even know what they're missing. And we like we also can't fault them, but it is also what we are oppressed by. And people, um, you know, have to remember uh, Spanish is a colonizing language too. And we need to call English and Spanish and Chinese languages, all these world languages, what they are. And they're settler colonial colonizing languages. And there are also very many beautiful things about them too. And they're still wreaking havoc. Yeah, when I was doing my um, undergraduate studies, at, you know, I was really looking at this notion of an endemic culture. And like, we know what an endemic species is. It's a species that's only found in one place in the whole world. Like the blue cheek butterfly fish is found in the Red Sea, right? And nowhere else. Um, Marcus has some San Clemente goats you know, that we say are from San Clemente Island. Uh, you won't find them anywhere else. Um, and colonizers say, oh, they're feral goats. No, those are indigenous goats. But anyway, that's another story. So sa same is true for, um, you know, like um, uh, endemic languages, endemic cultures, where you will not find uh, Yuchi spoken anywhere else in the world, you know. Will you find English spoken in other places? Yes, you'll find it everywhere. And so in biology, that's a cosmopolitan species. One that, like pigeons, they're everywhere. Uh, orcas, they're in every ocean. 
Um, but there's some things that are found in one place and they are uniquely adapted to that place. Um, and so they're more prone to uh, extinction, essentially, because if you mess up that place, you mess up that language. You mess up that place, you mess up those people. Um, because as we've said, you know, time again, we, we are the land as indigenous peoples. We are not, uh, you can't divorce us from the land. Uh, you can, but so much is lost. And, um, and, and, and I think what you're saying, Trisha, you know, just how important our languages are to honor them and that these colonial, you know, English and Spanish and, and, uh, Chinese, Cantonese, or whichever, or Mandarin, they have this, um, this spreading effect, kind of like a cosmopolitan species, like a, like a species that's found all over the world. And that's good to have a lingua franca, but like one that is from the heart and not from commerce would be wonderful. Um, yeah, anything else you all want to share? I just want to put a shout out there for oral traditions. Our language isn't written. So just always making space for different kinds of literacy and ours is oral so does that mean that in Karis children's learning center do you teach them to write it um or is it mostly just through the spoken and if you don't want to answer that question feel free not to. i just was curious oh no it's just through this it's through just spoken yeah but we still teach through it too but we also have our very specific like language culture like care our, our way of life lessons but we also like immerse children in it and they get other all the lessons in it content as well yeah i think i remember one time we were on the phone and i i think i asked you to spell nature for me which is thank you and karis and you're like mm, can't do that <laughs> i'm not gonna write it down and text you that's that's uh, dishonoring the the language and i i was told you know that it's not that our ancestors didn't have written language is what one elder told me they said it's we chose not to have written language you know we had written language all over the mayans the aztecs different groups in the north um but many of us chose not to because it was too easy to lie in the written language that's that's what one elder told me which i thought was fascinating um that we could have but we chose against it to remain oral peoples all these families they get together on like thanksgiving and and just uh, and uh what do you call it christmas or or you know whatever ho a couple holidays a t couple times a year but they're not rooted in place and so they don't defend the land they don't know the the have an intimate relationship with the the uh, species in their bioregional ecology and this is problematic um because it leads ultimately to ideologies of environmental destruction or at least making those those practices permissible um and so raising children um you know my, my children have a repertoire of, of 100 150 plants for instance um and that will continue to grow um but we focus on that and they, you know, study the barks, study the trees, study the bugs that are on the trees uh, that go with certain trees and, and plants. And this is, this is all part of being indigenous. It's part of the curriculum, raising children in a language uh, that, that is tied to that particular land. And it's, it's very important. Uh, and I just can't see it any other way. Right. And it's not appreciated because, because that, um, I don't, you, you expressed it better than me, Marcus, but I don't know why, but it was just in me that when I have children, my children are going to stop and look at this flower. My children are going to know to recognize this plant. My children are going to know, you know, how to chop wood, or they're going to know how to cook over an open fire, not because, um, like, that's for survival. That's what we expect our children to learn. You know, you see these developmental timelines and those developmental timelines are great. But what are our beliefs and practices? We already already had our early childhood. We already had developed milestones for what a five-year-old should do, what a 12-year-old should do, what, you know, whatever gender they are. Um, but, you know, it is so minimized. You know, there is 
all the gifts that come out of, yeah, it's a nature walk, but it's more than a nature walk. And then when you're walking, you know, with an elder, the all the teachings that come out of creating that intergenerational space. I mean, look at the public school setting. It's still happening. Elders are not a significant part of those settings. And so look at what our children are missing um, in those settings. So I just appreciate the remarks about um, studying the plants, knowing the leaves, studying the barks. That is all. It's not it's not just knowledge just to know. It's also it's also survival. Yeah, I think that the values when you're thinking about what values you want to transmit to your children, because it's not just about speaking language, right? In our community here, we're, we're an income sharing community. So everybody works. Um, and, and regardless of skill set or education level, everybody receives food, lodging, and a same $400 monthly stipend. And the reason for this small amount is to constrain our participation in capitalist consumerism because we know that it hurts the earth, which we're trying to regenerate here in our village and have a good relationship, reciprocal relationship here with the Mother Earth. And then it also hurts all peoples on the planet through exploited labor, through uh, slavery, uh, really, and, and, so, um, and, and keeps people in poverty. Uh, the, the, this this system. So do we want to participate in that and teach our children that when we say, when we're teaching them our culture, right, we're giving, teaching them speeches, and then, you know, we tell them uh, things like, that, that, you know, the earth is sacred. We say things like, we go about having love for one another. We, we have humility and meekness t- toward one another. But then if we don't embody those values, we are not teaching our children uh, correctly. And, and there's just so much to sift through in this decolonial process um, because we're so, all, so many things are normalized that are destructive or oppressive behaviors, and we are content with them. And people will say, you just... You need to focus on language. Don't worry about all this other stuff. Uh, but all these things are connected. And uh, the diet piece of it, I mean, people fought me about that too. But, but so how can you save your language if people aren't healthy? How can you teach your cultural values in the language if you don't actually live into them? So these, always thinking about authenticity and where our blinders are, what things are keeping us from really living into our indigeneity. Yeah, I love that holistic approach, you know, the ecosystemic approach of just, it's not just language, it's not just diet, it's not just uh, how we live, it's its all of it. And, and when you work them all together, they work uh, synergistically. Um, Halle, I think you wanted to share something. Please feel free if you like. Oh, I was just thinking more on the earlier discussion and how through the language, we see a different time, um, concept of time, and that we live in a different rhythm. And I see, even in our home language, that's lived out, I think, differently in Yuchi language um, and appreciating natural time and what that looks like, as you were referring to you know, observing this flower or growing these crops, you know, raising um, other creatures. And there's a different concept there that is so integral to our worldviews and what kind of people we are. And um, in our, so in our Yuchi language, there's you know, a different tense system than in English, and our present tense is much longer than in English, because in English, present tense has already cut off what I just said, that's already in the past, but in UT, our present tense is, you know, many minutes, and uh, there's a lot of different factors there, but I think that's one beautiful thing about raising kids to appreciate natural time and our indigenous worldview of time which is so it affects everything we do every day and it's a constant tension with the 
you know, colonial society where you have to be on time, you have to be on Zoom at a certain time, and, you know, how we're negotiating that in our programs and in our, our language work, it's all a challenge, so. Yeah, I, I saw a little meme or whatever it said, I want to speak my native language so f well that my English is broken. Um, <laughs> it's funny because like maybe a few days before I saw that meme, I was like, if I really, really dedicated myself to Denebizad, which I speak, you know, several hundred words, but still nowhere near being able to hold a conversation. Um, if I really dedicated myself to, to, to learning that language, living that language, being immersed in it, understanding it through and through, you know, it would change me as a person. And I would imagine that it would, that like English wouldn't <laughs> make sense anymore. <laughs> Obviously all of us here, we can speak English fine. Um, but I think it would be wonderful for, for those listeners, you know, I think we have a lot of inspiring examples here. You know, Trisha, not being a, a native language speaker, just like me, uh, and hearing from her mentors that, you know, you can still be a language teacher, you can still be a language speaker, uh, and teaming up with your elders, Trisha, who are first language speakers and creating a beautiful school that you have, you know, I think that really gives people like me hope that we can do this and, and also that we're not off the hook, you know, <laughs> a lot of people are like, well, you didn't learn it when you were before five years old, so it's it's impossible now. You know, it's like, no, you are living proof that that is not true. And we're not off the hook, you know. I'm speaking to all my peers, 20-somethings, 30-somethings, you know, we got we gotta jump in this fight as well. And so it's, it's just wonderful to be with all of you, and we're gonna wrap up soon, but is there any final words anyone would like to share before we close this very precious uh, little podcast? Pao san la ki asota anzidit ne chi san le nande onk aju da he en onk anfe go chatla go wedene ha na we le non ta na no one le na so i also appreciate everyone on the call and um we uh uplift those out there who are listening wherever they're at in their language journey and want to encourage you to um Take some steps to continue learning your language, but also realize everyone's in a different place and uh, it's a long journey. It's a spiritual journey and I think for each of us it's been a lifelong journey and it, it will continue to be uh, a, you know, internal decolonizing and spiritual journey, but also a community a labor of love you know i believe this work of raising babies in the language is the ultimate solution to creating new fluent speakers and it's our most it's the area we're most empowered in our own homes to wake up every day and speak only our indigenous languages to our children san lake asuta I just want to express my gratitude um, to Lila for hosting this really important conversation and um, that I'm honored to be on this call with Trisha and Halle um, that are really living into this work. Uh, we say we want new fluent speakers um, and and uh, I know they have um, sacrificed their lives, uh, given up so much to ensure that their children are fluent speakers um, as we have and it's really encouraging uh, to see that. Mado chigez al Nature, nature, hale, nature, Marcus, good nature, Layla June, got you, you chits, hot, jitashi in this conversation. And I um, am really grateful for how we got here and, and continue to be inspired by the both of you, Marcus and Hale. And of course, beautiful, dearest Layla June, for using always her platform to amplify and celebrate language, our indigenous languages. Um, and just reiterating what Marcus said, like embodying our values, embodying, it's like, yes, you have to talk it, but yes, it's, you have to live it too. And that's hard. That's, that's the journey. That's the work. But I strongly believe that our languages, our indigenous languages are, are a pathway back to our wholeness. 
And when we give language to our children, then we are have a better chance of having a society where children are respected and centered, which means too that women have a better chance of being centered and loved and respected even more. And when people say that the future is indigenous, the past was indigenous, right? And the present, it's it's telling the truth. And part of our truth, a huge part of our truth is embedded in our languages. And our languages tell us who we are. They will, and they will teach us and continue to teach us how to survive. And so languages and love and children and like go team let's let's do this we can keep keep going so nature thank you so much Layla. nature mado uh, uh, thank you all so much and uh thank you for listening to nehije our voices and indigenous solutions podcast it's been a joy having you all with us and our strong prayers are with you when i was a little girl in the schools yeah they had me fooled they said your native culture it ain't got nothing for you and if you want success get a gold star be the best so i went to the best school i could find and i left my culture behind when my grandmother was a little girl In the boarding schools, yeah, they had her fooled They said that her dark skin was original sin And if she wanted to be saved Then in Jesus' name she prayed So she left for college on a train She'll have everything she needs She'll have a choice of who to be She can speak her native language And she can still love her neighbor Love the color of her skin See the beauty that lies within Cause we, we remember who we are And that supremacy was a lie from the start down there's no stopping us now our head held high feet on the ground elder songs we hear the sound we hear the sound we hear the sound we hear the sound i hear the sound i hear the sound i hear the sound i hear the can't cut this down there's no stopping us now our head held high feet on the ground elder songs we hear the sound